All right, are you ready for the word now? All right, how many going to help me preach today? All right, okay, let's get started. Yeah, today we're going to conclude our series called That's a Wrap. As my wife and I wrap up our 20 year season as your lead pastors. As we do this, I have felt compelled, I felt a leading of the Lord to reiterate some of the main themes of our ministry. Things that I have felt uh, that I should focus on, things I have consistently taught you for the past 20 years. See, I believe that God does things in seasons. A season for this, a season for that. Some seasons are short and some are long. Our season has lasted for 20 years. What I love about that is that was our goal. That was our desire when we moved here. My wife and I, both of us said, what in the world could we do for God? What could God do through us and through our ministry if we were to commit to one church for 20 years? That was 20 years ago, and here we are at the end of that. So, and I just want to tell you that this has been one of the, one of the best seasons of our ministry, one of the, some of the best years of our lives, and hopefully... The church can say that as, as well. Yeah. Well, all of us are about to embark on a new season. I believe that God wants to emphasize some different things in this next season. Now, new seasons bring both excitement and they also bring a little Sadness. Yes, there's the excitement of a new season. What is God going to do next? What is going to happen here next? And that's exciting. And there is the excitement of a new season. But there's also a little sadness. And I must, I must be honest with you that, that part of me is excited about my new season, about what God is going to do in, in and through me and my wife in, in, in the next season. But also there's a little sadness. There's a little sadness because, because new season, for new seasons uh, to come about, there has to be the end of an old season. So new seasons bring both excitement, a little sadness, as we must let go of the past in order to embrace the future. But before this new season begins, we are, we are reiterating, we are remembering some of the things, not all of the things, but some of the things that we have learned these past 20 years in this past season. I want to read our text for this series one last time. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1. It begins with verse number 12, down through verse 15, reading from the New Living Translation. And it says this, it says, it says therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. But it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. Well, so far in this series, we've talked about caring, and we've talked about giving, and we've talked about growing. Today, we're going to talk about serving. Don't stop serving. You know, serving is a foreign concept in our modern consumer mentality society. Most people's attitudes today is, what's in it for me? And what have you done for me lately? But true Jesus people aren't consumers, they're servants. Yeah. See, to be a true Christian means to be Christ-like. That's what the word Christian means. It means Christ-like. And what was he like? Well, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 says, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. In John uh, chapter 13 and verse 15, Jesus said, Jesus said, I have given you an example of servanthood. He said, you should do for others what I have done for you. God is calling all of us to servanthood. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 24, Jesus said, a servant is not above his master. Listen to me, friends. Consumer Christianity needs to stop. 
You've heard me tell the story of many years ago when I was pastoring in Midland, Texas. I was sitting in my office one day when I received a phone call from a man. And the man said to me, he said, he said, I, I hear there's some really good things going out, on out there in your church, that Harvest Time Church. I said, yeah, we're excited. God is doing wonderful things at our church. And this man said to me, he said, well, he said, well, I'm considering bringing my family out to your church. He said, he, he said to me, he said, what does your church have to offer me and my family? Kind of, kind of gruff, kind of like, what, what does your church have to offer me and offer my family? Well, I spent about 15 minutes telling him about the incredible ministry opportunities of that church and all of the things that would be available for every single one, himself, his wife, his children. There was something for everybody and spent some time talking about the things that our church had to offer. Then I said, sir, you have asked me, what, what does my church have to offer you? I think it's only fair for me to ask you, what do you and your family have to offer my church? It got rather quiet. He was not ready for that question. But how many know that's a fair question? It's a fair question. It's time for consumer Christianity to stop. It's time for God's people to stop looking for a title and start looking for a towel. I want to give give you four statements about servanthood today. The first statement I want to make is this, that is there's a place for you to serve. Amen. Yeah, there is a place for you to serve. See, see there's no lack of opportunity for servants. There, there, there are places that need to be filled. The problem so often is we, we want the place that we're not qualified for. We want the place that maybe we're not ready for, or maybe we want the place that somebody else is already in that place. I remember as a very young pastor wanting some places that, that in all honesty, I had no business occupying because I was not ready for those places yet. Those places would literally have eaten my lunch, and God knew it, and so, and so because he loved me, he spared me by not putting me in those places. Let me give you a couple of tips today that'll help you discover your place. Maybe you, you don't know where your place is and how am I gonna find that place? How am I gonna find my place, Pastor? Well, let me give you a couple of tips that will help you discover your place. The first one is this, your place will provide you an opportunity to use your particular giftings. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8, Paul writes, Paul writes, and he says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts. What kind of gifts? Different. We all have the same gifts? No, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. We can do everything well? Certain things, yeah. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So Paul writes, he says, so, so if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. He says, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. He writes, he says, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness for others, do it gladly. Yeah. And then 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 says, God has given each of you a gift. Well, Pastor, I'm not sure I have a gift. Yes, you do. Paul said, God has given each of you right. a gift right. from his great variety. Don't you love that? Yeah, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of gifts. We all have gifts. Just because your gift is not my gift or my gift is not your gift doesn't mean we don't have gifts. We all have gifts. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of gifts. So use them well. Yes. Notice what he says, to serve Amen. one another. 
Pastor, how do I find my place of service? Discover your particular gifting and then look for a place where it's needed. Here's another tip, and that is your place will include something that you have a passion for. See, God is not about trying to make your life miserable. You might think, especially as a young person, you might think, oh, oh man, I hope God doesn't call me to be a preacher, or I hope God doesn't call me into full-time ministry. Oh, 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 I just would be so miserable. No, you wouldn't. Now, if you try to do full-time ministry without a calling, you definitely will be miserable. But God will not call you without giving you a passion, a desire for whatever it is that he is calling you to. See, the God who, who created you knows you intimately. He, he knows all about you. He knows you inside. He knows you out. He, he knows where you will fit. We won't all fit at the same place. We won't all fit anywhere, but there's a place that we will fit. And God knows where that place is. He knows what will fulfill you. He knows where you will be most effective. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, we find recorded the account where Jesus went to the home of the two sisters, Mary and Martha. And if you know the story, you know that Mary was a worshiper. In fact, that's what she was doing in that story. She was kneeling at the feet of Jesus and she was worshiping her Lord. Mary was a worshiper. Her sister Martha was a worker. Now, there's a whole lot more to this story than this, but included in this story is the fact that even though these two sisters were polar opposites, I mean, they're sisters, but they're as different as night and day. They are polar opposites, and yet they both had their place. See, just because you're not like somebody else doesn't mean that you do not have a place. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a place for you. Because Mary and Martha, they were sisters, but they were polar opposite, but they both had their place. And yes, we usually praise Mary for her worship. Even Jesus did that. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you that when worship time was over, everybody was glad that Martha worked and dinner was served. Your place will include something you have a passion for. Here's something I have observed, and that is we're usually pretty good at what we are passionate about. Discover your true passion, and you will have a clue about your place. But not only is there a place for you to serve, number two, there is a people. Yeah, there's a people for you to serve. Now, we should love everybody, right? Right? We should love everybody, but there is a particular set of people that we are called to individually. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 7, it says that Peter was called to reach the Jews and Paul was called to reach the Gentiles. Both of these men, men of God, but God had different people for them to serve. See, the truth is not everybody is going to receive us. We're not going to be effective and have influence with everyone, but we will with some. We will with the ones that we have specifically been called by God to. Well, you might say, well, pastor, how do I find these people? How, how do I find my people? How do I know who my people are? Well, thanks for asking. That makes my job a whole lot easier. The answer is found in my next two questions. And the first question is this. Who are the people that are already in your life? When you're trying to find your people, ask yourself, who are the people that are already in my life? Because you see, God has a way of getting us exactly where he wants us and with the people that he wants us with. You know, we make things much, much harder than they really are. You know, often we, we look for things that are already staring us in the face. We find this true. We find it in the story in, recorded in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, through the story of the healing of the lame man. 
You know the story. This man, this man was lame, and he couldn't, he couldn't walk, and so he couldn't work. He couldn't make a living. And so this man, the, the story goes, this man was carried every single day to the gate of, of the temple. And he would sit there every single day, all day long, with his beggar's cup. And as people would come into the temple to pray and to worship, they would put a penny or two in his cup. And every single day he would sit there and beg for alms. The story goes that Peter and John came by one day, and through his encounter with these two men of God, a miracle takes place, and he's healed. What a story. What an incredible story. But my question is, if he was there every single day, and that's what the Bible says, that daily he was laid at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And so if he was there every single day, and if it was the practice of Peter and John to go to the temple every day to pray, oh, and it was, then my question is, how, how many times had they walked by him in the past? Don't tell me this was the first day that, that Peter and John had met this man. Don't tell me this was the first day they had ever had an encounter because he was there every day and Peter and John went to the temple daily to pray. How many times had they, had they walked by him in the past? And not only had they walked by him in the past, but how many times did they, did they, did they go into the temple to pray and in their prayer, no doubt they were praying and asking God, God, where should we go to do ministry, and yet they had just walked past ministry on their way in to pray about ministry. Ministry was already staring them in the face in the life of this lame man. Oh, oh, pastor, how do, how do I discover who my people are? Begin by asking, who are the people that are already in my life? These people have probably been placed there by God for one of two reasons. Either, either they are there for us to help or they are there to help us or probably for both. My second question here is this. Who are the people that give you an audience? You're looking for your people? Ask yourself, who are the people that give me an audience? Because the truth of the matter is not everybody will hear you. Some will not include you or even recognize your presence. These are not your people. Jesus recognized this, and what did he say we should do about it? Well, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 14, Jesus said to shake the dust off your feet and move on. And I believe this morning that this is a word for somebody here today. Stop trying to fit into a crowd that will not make room for you. And stop trying to force a relationship with somebody who doesn't seem to want a relationship with you. Write this down this morning. Go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. These are not your people. Shake the dust off of your feet and move on. But not only do I want to talk to you and, and I want you to know that there's a place for you to serve and there's a people for you to serve. But number three, I want to, I want to say this, and that is there's a purpose yeah. for your serving. A purpose for your serving. And the purpose for serving is actually twofold. First of all, your serving will benefit others. It'll benefit others. All of us have people in our lives who are looking to us. They're depending on us and the part that we play in their lives. The disciples, they, they looked to Jesus, and he did not disappoint on one such occasion found in John chapter 13, Jesus literally performed the degrading task of washing the dirty feet of his disciples. People traveled mostly on foot in those times and mostly they wore sandals. There were no paved streets and so, and so, and so, and so their feet would get dirty. But Saying their feet got dirty is very mild. <laughs> because not only was there dirt and dust and mud that they had to walk through, but there was also, also the animal droppings they had to deal with. So not only did they have 
dirt on their feet, they had dung. <laughs> Good old King James Version word <laughs> on their feet. And because of this, it was literally disgusting. And so it was the lowest of servants who had the job of washing the people's feet. The very lowest of servants. And when Jesus and his disciples assembled and, and they were going to share a meal, they were going to eat. And so on this occasion, there was, there was no servant to wash their feet. Reading between the lines and just thinking a little bit, I, I wonder, I wonder if the disciples might have had a discussion among themselves. I wonder if they might have been talking among themselves. And one of them says, you know what? Somebody needs to wash their feet. Man, our feet are dirty. They're disgusting. They stink. Somebody, there's no servant here. Somebody needs to wash our feet. We, we, we can't eat with dirty feet. It's not, it's not right. It's not our custom. Yeah. Peter, you do it. <laughs> Peter says, no, Andrew, you do it. Andrew says, no, this is definitely a job for Bartholomew. <laughs> One of the other disciples might have said, yeah, sounds like a Barth job to me. <laughs> and in the midst of their passing the buck, in the midst of nobody wanting to be a servant, in the midst of nobody wanting to clean up the mess, nobody wanting to take, the, 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 take care of the need, in the midst of this, here comes Jesus with a wash basin in hand and a towel around his waist. There's a purpose for our serving. Our serving benefits others. Friend, there are some messes that need to be cleaned up. I said there's some messes that need to be cleaned up. And there are some messes that only true servants are willing to clean up. Last night, as the ladies were honoring my wife, many of them were relating to the fact that, that my wife helped them clean up a mess. I've watched my wife as a servant. She is. I've watched her serve, and I've watched her over and over and over and over again. I've, I've actually sat in my recliner while she sat in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in her chair next to me, and we was going to watch something on TV or whatever, whatever, but an hour goes by, two hours goes by. I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over, night after night after night, helping somebody clean up their mess. Listen, life gets messy sometimes, and people get their lives in a mess sometimes, and they need, they need a servant. They need somebody that'll, that'll serve. They need somebody that'll, that'll stand beside them, somebody that'll be with them to help them. But all, not only will your serving benefit others, your serving will bless you. Yeah, your serving will bless you. Have you ever done something substantial for somebody? I, I don't mean some little bitty something. I mean, have you ever done something, I mean, substantial for somebody who couldn't bless you back? It blessed you, right? It blessed you. It, it made you feel so good to be able to do for somebody. Oh, something substantial. Oh, you were able to help them and you were able to provide, you know, some assistance or you were able to, to, to provide for them something that they couldn't provide for themselves, knowing that there was no way that it would ever be reciprocated. It would never come back to you from that person. But oh, how wonderful it made you feel to be able to Amen. bless someone. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus who said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Yeah. Back to the story of Jesus watching the disciples' feet. John chapter 13, verse 15 through 17. Jesus said, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Jesus said, slaves are not better than their master. And Jesus said this, now that you know this, God will bless you if you do this. 
There's a purpose for your serving. It's twofold. First, it will benefit others, and second, it will bless you. Here's what I know, friend, and that is fulfillment comes. Fulfillment comes not from receiving all you want, but from serving and meeting the needs of others. The fourth and the final statement that I want to make to you today is this. There's a promise to those who serve well. Servanthood has its rewards. First, we're going to receive earthly rewards. Listen to these verses, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. God will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have, sho- how you have shown your love to him. Notice this, by caring for other believers. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24 says, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. And the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. And Luke chapter 18 and verse 28 through 30, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, we've left all and we have followed you. Lord, we've left it all behind. We've we've, We've left everything to follow you. Jesus replied, anyone who has left anything for me will be paid back many times over in this life and will have eternal life as well. Did you know it's actually impossible to give anything? Oh, we don't like it when the preacher talks about giving. Oh, we bow up. We don't like it. But did you know that it is actually impossible to actually give anything? Because the Bible says that when we give, it comes back. But not only does it come back, but it comes back with interest. So really, we can't, no matter how much we give out, we can't get rid of it. It still, it comes back to us. That's the word of God. I don't know about you. I just, I believe it and practice it. Jesus said in Matthew, one last verse, Matthew 10, verse 42, Jesus said, if you merely offer someone as little as a cup of cold water, he says, you will certainly be rewarded. Servanthood has its rewards. You may think you're really giving out, man. I mean, oh, man, I'm really giving, I'm really serving, I'm really giving out. You may think that, but friend, what is coming back to you is far greater. But not only will will we receive earthly rewards, but we will receive eternal rewards. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 says, Make it your aim to be well-pleasing to God. Did you know we can be pleasing to God or we can be displeasing to God? Oh, I know, and we love, we love to talk about the fact that no matter what we do, we can never make God not love us. And I believe that. We can, sure make, we can sure make God angry at us. We can tick him off. Hello? Come on. Make it your aim to be well-pleasing to God. My kids can't do anything to make me stop loving them, but there's times when I like them more than I do other times. Come on. And it's no different with our Heavenly Father either. I want to please him. How about you? I want to please him. Let me read that. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10. Make it your aim to be well-pleasing to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, please understand this totally. Good works can never save us. We could never, ever do enough good works. No matter how many good works we did, we could never do enough good works to save us. Good works cannot save us. We can only be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can only be saved by placing our faith in God's wonderful grace. And yet it's going to be our works that will determine the degree of our eternal rewards. See, heaven's not a one-size-fits-all kind of place. It's not. There's going to be degrees of reward in heaven. Everybody's not going to be on the same page. Everybody's not going to be on the same level. Everybody's not going to receive the same rewards. We're going to be rewarded based upon the works that we did. Saved by the blood, rewarded by works. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15 says, On judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work a person has done. The fire will reveal if a person's work has any value. 
If the work survives, that person will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the person will receive a great loss. The person will be saved, but like somebody barely escaping through a wall of flames. I don't know about you, but I don't want a heaven like that where I barely get in by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Here's what I know this morning. That is true servanthood done with pure motives will survive the test of fire and will be rewarded with eternal rewards. As your pastor, it's not my goal to just get you to heaven. And oh, it is my goal. Oh, it would break my heart if anybody under my, under my care did not make heaven. Oh, oh, I want everybody to make heaven. But listen, listen, it's not my goal just to get you to heaven. But I want some rewards waiting on you when you get there. And those rewards are going to be based on works. They're going to be based on serving Did you serve? And what attitude did you serve with? Don't stop serving. And if you're not serving, it's time to stop. That consumer mentality that's even in the church today needs to stop. Needs to stop. We need to stop trying to find the perfect church. And we need to start saying, God, where's my place? Where's my place? Well, I don't like what they're doing, but I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, are you going to leave your place? I don't know about you, but I want to stay in my place. Amen? Don't stop serving. Amen. The takeaway for the message this morning is this. Serving should be viewed as an honor not as a hardship. It's an honor. It's a privilege. See, I'm not of that group that loves to whine about how hard it is to live for God and how hard it is to be in ministry. Not that hard times are not a part of it, but I'm of that group that says, what a, What a privilege, what an honor, what a joy.